Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today for our session on practical cyber risk management. This was really popular course, so it's nice to see lots of you here today. Um, we wanted to get the year off to a good start by giving you the opportunity to learn new practical skills for free and give you a taster of what our training sessions are like. The session will last 90 minutes and we'll have a Q&A at the end. Your microphones will be on mute throughout the session, so if you've got any questions, just type them into the chat box. And any that we don't get to answer today, we'll upload to our YouTube and social media channels as a Q&A session. Throughout the day, we're also going to be sharing big questions on LinkedIn and Twitter, and anybody that engages with those will be entered into a draw to win one of the Madlug tech backpacks that we've put a link to in the chat. There's a prize for Twitter and LinkedIn, and also if anyone leaves us a Google review, that will be included too. So three chances to win one of those bags. So your trainer today is Sean Hanna, founder of Nemstar, and he knows everything about everything about risk management. Um, so if you're ready to learn, let's get started, Sean. Thank you very much indeed, John. Uh, I'm not sure about that intro. Okay. I thought you were just going to stop, stop when you said he knows everything about everything, but there you go. Okay. <laughs> okay, folks. Uh, hello. Welcome in. Uh, for those people that are masochists in the audience, this might be your third session of four today. Well done if you're doing them all. This is part of our, our free training January offer. Just giving a little bit back, seeing can we kick the year off uh, with some good spirits. We promised no marketing, no sales, just learning. So we will try very hard to stick to our promise and we'll try very hard to do what it says practical cyber risk management, a toolkit that works. Uh, out of all the sessions we offered, this is the session that most people signed up for. And I think I could have nearly predicted that. We had sessions on introductory to cyber, hack chain, uh, and what your senior management team but this is the one that most people signed up for. Why? Because it's difficult. It is really hard to do this. So if you want some practical hints and tips, some things that I have learned from the past 25 years in industry, that's what we'll try to share with you today. Can we make you risk experts in 90 minutes? No, we cannot. We'd be lying if we said we could. So I'm going to concentrate on things that I've come across personally as an auditor, as a risk uh, specialist, as a pen tester, uh, as a non-executive director advising companies on strategic uh, cybersecurity roadmaps. These are the common things that people get wrong. So if you fix some of the stuff that we're going to go through, you can take a risk management framework that doesn't work for the important people, but doesn't work for the stakeholders, the shareholders and the senior management of the company. And hopefully you can turn it around. My name uh, is Sean Hanna. Uh, my background is I'm a systems engineer by trade. I've been working in IT and information security uh, since the 1990s. I started off when Windows used to be called Windows 3.1. That wasn't 3.11, that was 3.1. 3.11 for work groups was a major upgrade. Okay, the title that we're doing, but the reason why so many people have signed up, we forget something. Risk is a specialism. If you want to study this properly, go to university, sign up for a heavy duty four year degree in advanced mathematics. Your course will be called actuarial science because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about advanced mathematical models that can be used by specialists to try to predict future outcomes. Think about what risk is actually trying to do. We're trying to predict the future, literally. Now, if we could do that, I know the first thing I'd predict was, and it wouldn't be IS risks. Of course, it would be 
the lottery numbers, wouldn't it? So this is not something that is guaranteed to work. We look at current situations, we look at history, we look at other organisations and we extrapolate. We extrapolate in a scientific way. So if you are coming from IT or information security and you're coming into risk for the first time and you're finding this difficult, there's a reason for it. You're supposed to do four years at university to study risks and then You'd need to know about IT and information systems and cybersecurity to apply that knowledge to our specialist area. What I've tried to do is two things today simultaneously. We're going to go over eight steps that I follow when I engage with a customer to roll out a risk assessment process, a risk management program. If you ask me in the consult, these are the eight steps of the program that I will do. And doing those eight steps of the program, I've learned some lessons along the way. The eight steps are the eight steps that I will go through. The lessons are the pitfalls within the eight steps. And we've mixed them up. Some steps have no lessons, some steps have several lessons. So you're going to find a mixture throughout it between the eight steps and the 10 lessons. We'll get to the end, and then we'll try to summarize what those eight steps and 10 lessons were. Shall we start? So, sitting down to write a slide set like this, and we did sit down and write this from scratch. It is based loosely on an ASACA program called C-Risk, and an ASACA framework called COVID, something called risk IT and risk IT and COVID they're great tools but they're big they're bulky they're awkward so when I sit down to do it I start with a business asset registry from which we derive an IS risk registry from that we do a control self-assessment then we do a formal risk assessment and a business risk analysis. Interesting, we've got assessment followed by analysis. That's an interesting point we'll come to later on. Notice that one of our major steps is a risk decision. It's a business risk decision, followed by IS control design and implementation, and then audit. Well, I am an auditor. I've been in the auditor for many, many years. And I suppose you could say it's my self-interest to include audit in everything. But audit is an essential part of any risk program. Without audit, our risk program will fail to deliver what the senior leadership team, what management, what the business actually wants. We're going to go through each of these one at a time. We're going to talk about it. I'm going to give you as many practical examples uh, that I possibly can. We're not going to get into actually calculating risks because there's a dozen different ways to do it. We won't talk about the actual databases and frameworks that you can type stuff in because there's a thousand vendors that you can give a choice from. What we're going to stick to is the eight steps and 10 lessons that you can take away. And I think if you apply the steps and learn the lessons, you can apply it to any risk management program and you can improve your output in a practical, real, tangible way. So straight off, there's a lesson to be learned. Before we even start, there's a lesson to be learned. Successful risk processes do nothing. They, they, they do nothing at all. They accomplish nothing. Okay, people are going, what's my job? You're talking about years. The risk process is part of a large set of apparatus to manage information security risks in a business. And we are but one cog in that machine. And what do I mean by this? It's this bit. 
translate. See, why do we do risk assessments at all? Surely all we should have to do is to patch everything, to secure everything. Then we don't have to worry about risk assessments. Why do we bother? What's the purpose of it? I can tell you from my perspective and a COVID perspective. It's translation. You see, we have created a problem in the systems that we've set up. We've created a them and an us. The people who want the risk process uh, conducted is the business, your leadership team, your senior management team. It's the, it's the business that wants us to do this. The business wants to know risks have been managed. You see, in IT and IS, we have a problem, and this problem does not just exist in IT and IS. It exists in finance, HR, marketing, sales. It exists in manufacturing, research and development. It exists in every single department. Your leadership team are the people who make decisions. The decisions that they make directly affect the success or failure of our organization. But there's a problem. The director in charge of HR may not understand firewalls and ransomware. The director in charge of research and development may not understand political risks or may not understand international currency hedging. If you're about an international supply chain, currency fluctuations are just as big a risk as ransomware. And you see, they have to understand this. Decisions made at a board level should be made by the board as a unit. Your senior management team should not be looking to HR to make all HR decisions. Every other manager has staff. HR may guide, they may help, they may support, but employment and human capital decisions, they're made as a board. Ransomware protection decisions should not be made by an IT director or a CISO or a CIO or a CTO. They should be made collectively as a board. And here lies the problem. Do you understand international currency hedging? Do you understand political risk? Do you understand human capital risk? You see, you might understand fishing and farming and cross-site scripting and SQL injection and ransomware, but that does not mean that if you make it up that greasy ladder right to the very top and you get that seat on the board, you get that seat on the board, you will be expected to understand and to contribute outside your own area, outside your own silo. So there's the conundrum. How can you make effective decisions on political risk, human capital risk, currency hedging? if you don't understand those topics? And the answer is, you can't. In exactly the same way, you cannot expect the HR director to understand ransomware. You cannot expect the finance director to know the difference between fishing and farming. You cannot expect the research and development director to understand the difference between a cross-site request, forgery, and a cross-site script they still have to make decisions you still need their support so what are we supposed to do well COVID and isaka one of the reasons why i like COVID and isaka they don't make stuff up they, they do what i like doing plagiarizing what a wonderful word plagiarizing and they plagiarize from other models from all their standards, 
from other people. And they looked, and they looked at the Harvard MBA model of how to run a business. And they looked at, in an MBA, what is risk? Risk, according to the Harvard MBA model, is a translation. It translates technically complicated topics that your leadership team do not understand into a shared common language. Risk doesn't fix anything. Risk was never supposed to fix things. Risk was supposed to translate it into a language that everybody on your senior leadership team can understand. Because you see, if you ask me to make a decision as a director, I will always have conflicting objectives. And the only way I can make a rational decision is to be able to compare apples with apples. The Harvard MBA says, look, it doesn't matter if it's political risk, international currency hedging, human capital risk, Brexit risk, COVID risk, the risk of uh, Putin amassing 100,000 troops on the borders of Ukraine. It does not matter if it's that or ransomware or fishing. When it gets to the board level, it's supposed to be standardized into one set of language, the language of risk. I cannot make a decision if you offer me an apple, a banana and an orange and say, which do I like the best? It's different. An, an apple's nice at the end of the day. If you've eaten something, you want to clean your teeth, you want a nice refreshing bite, crunchy apple, lovely. If you're thirsty and it's warm, nice refreshing juicy orange, there's nothing to beat it. If you're out for a cycle or a hike and you're hungry, what you need is a banana. You see, how many different types of risk report does your board get? Because the answer is supposed to be one. We're supposed to all use the same standardized risk templates across the board. We're supposed to translate all of the stuff that we're doing that is technically complicated into a shared set of language. Lesson number one. What does risk actually do? It translates. Nothing more. Risk yes, John, can I cut in a second? Yep. I've got a question here that's maybe right. um uh, you mentioned cyber risks and information security risks. Should this not be one thing, and that should be information security and remove the comment of cyber security risks? Well, it depends how large your business is. You know, in a small or medium sized business, absolutely they should be combined together. But if you deal with uh, one of my customers is a Fortune 50 insurance company, one of the biggest insurance companies in the world. Their organization is so large, cyber risk and IS risk are separated. Cyber risk relates directly to technology risk and is a subset of information risk. So when we assess it, if it's a very big scale, cyber risk can be assessed separately to IS and can then be combined together. Should we have two separate reports at the board level? No. When I'm talking about IS and cyber risk, I'm talking about it as a combined report, a report that looks at information system security and looks at technical controls and technical security at the same time. So you can assess them separately, definitely, because a pen test might look at technical cyber risk where an audit might focus on IS risk. But you need to combine those before it reaches the board because the board should only have one single report. I think that's what the question is. So if you're asking me if the board should have a single report, the answer is absolutely yes, but you might assess them separately. Okay, good question. And a okay. quick follow-on. Um, 
can this framework be applied to operational technology as it seems to be on face value for enterprise only? Oh, well, why would it not apply to operational technology? You see, the thing about the framework that we're looking at and the process we're looking at, it's supposed to not come solely from IT or IS. It's supposed to come from the Harvard MBA. So when we look at risks, it will be business risks that we look at. And I think you can apply exactly the same thing to operational risk, finance risk, economic risk. It doesn't matter what risk discipline, it's still going to result in the same report reaching the board in the same language being standardized in the same way. Very good folks, paying attention anyway. Okay. Purpose of risk, to translate complicated technical issues into a shared language of understanding. So the first question is, do you know what that looks like? Does your board have a template for that shared language? Is there a requirement? I mean, there's no point in doing this if HR comes up and rates risk as a percentage, finance rates it in an alphabet, we come up and rate it one to 10. If you're not rating it all the same way, if it's not reaching that shared language, you've failed before you've even started. The first thing that I do to try to make sure that it's business risk that we're after is we start with a business asset registry. I have audited many organizations and they start with an IT registry and they look at risks on an IT registry. That is not what we do. We are information systems and cyber risk. We look at the business processes. So the business asset registry, that is not something we manage. It's not something an IS nor a cyber team own. Okay. It's not all about IT systems. Lesson number two, a business asset registry is necessary because we want to look at the business processes that create risk, not the IT system. Our job is to help the business deal with business risk, not IT risk. The business must understand its processes. We and the IT team and the cyber team, we need to understand the network servers and the cloud. You see, I find a lot of boards going, no, 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 no. We don't do anything. You do it all. We can't. We, we, we can't do it all. In actual fact, that within COVID, we say we only perform risk assessments on the things that are in the business asset registry. And it is not the job of an IS, or IT, SOC, cyber, whatever you, it is not our job to create a business asset registry. The business is supposed to know the assets it has. The business assets can be absolutely anything. It can be processes, information, people, systems, it's whatever creates value in the organization. The business first needs to understand its own business structure, its own processes. It's supposed to have a business asset registry that's maintained usually by a risk committee, not an IS risk committee, not an IT risk, not a cyber risk, but just a generic risk committee of some sort. In a smaller business, it still needs to exist. You know, your sales process is a business asset. Inside the sales process, you will have people, you will have a CRM database, you will have invoicing and sales and sales history. Those things come from the process, which is the sales process itself. We, we are supposed to look at the business asset registry. And the business asset registry is essential because lesson three already. We can't succeed without risk ownership. The goal is to translate. The reason why we translate is to allow someone to make a decision. And that someone is the risk owner. And the risk owner is the 
business process owner. Without a business risk registry, business process risk registry, ownership is not clear. I see problems all the time of people turning around and saying, you know, IT deals with that. You know, if it's a sales system, the CRM system, the customer relational management system, IT doesn't own that. IT are merely custodians of other people's data. The person who owns that risk is the business, and that's why we need it, because one of the things that we need is ownership. The business owns all risk without exception, and we need to know who those risk owners are. They are actually the people that are accountable, accountable and responsible, important words in risk. I may be responsible for running a risk assessment. I may be responsible for ensuring my team have the right skills and use the right processes. I might be responsible for bringing to management issues, for offering them choices. But it's the leadership team that's accountable. The risk owner is legally accountable. IT and IS are merely custodians. You cannot make a responsible person or a responsible function accountable. This is the legality behind risk in the business. If the CRM database containing sensitive customer information protected under law, GDPR, if that is leaked, it is not IT or IS that gets held for it. It's the business risk owner. They are the accountable people. This business risk owners always make the decisions. Business risk owners fund the decisions they make. Applying controls to systems can cost them a lot of money. We know that. Where does the budget come from? It comes from the business risk owners making that decision. What is the business risk? Who is the risk owner accountable? Who is the risk manager responsible? How important to the business is the risk? These are basic, basic questions we cannot continue without. These things should be resolved before any risk assessments occur. And it's not just us. HR, health and safety, finance risk, you name the risk, it's all supposed to come from the one business asset registry, a single source of ownership information in a company. You see, if we have this, this becomes so much easier. We look at the business asset registry and our job, information systems. What information does this process have? What IT systems, what networks, what cloud systems, what vendors are responsible for processing, for uh, controlling, for storing that information? And it's that information that we do risk assessments on. You see, if we have a proper business risk asset registry, this becomes really quite easy. OK, we use the business asset registry to identify information risks, information system risks and technology risks. But we do it from the business asset registry. The IS risk department is responsible for looking at these risks, for measuring them, for reporting them, for making sure that the level of risk exists is the level that management have accepted and funded. We don't try to eliminate it, obviously. I'm not even going to go in it. All we're trying to do is to make sure the level we promised them, the level they think they have, is the actual level they have. Now, I didn't do this at the start. I usually went straight to step four. 
Once I had my IS risk register, I went straight to do a risk assessment. But it didn't work because I kept getting the same thing. The business saying, no, nothing to do with us. It's an IT problem. It's an IS problem. You go away and fix it. So involve the business at every single step. How do I do that? A controlled self-assessment. The first thing that I do is I don't go out and look at risk as it sits. I don't go and do an IS risk assessment. The first thing I do is a CSA, a control self-assessment. If you like, survey monkey. An easy to fill in form, spreadsheet, web page, survey monkey email asking business focused questions about the information asset. You see, by doing this, I'm immediately saying, look, we're going to do a risk assessment. It's going to be an IS risk assessment. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to look at technology. We're going to look at IT. We're not going to do pen tests. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to talk to the information asset owners. Because if there's no owner, who's making a decision? And if there's nobody to make a decision, why are we translating it? Remember, we're translating it in order for somebody to make a decision. See, control self-assessment can be absolutely anything. OK, the control self without a control self-assessment, the business does not believe it's accountable. You do not get the engagement. I've said that. The control self-assessment, let's take a little look at one of them. So this is actually one that I use myself. We, we developed it for a number of customers. And the point of it, it's really rather easy. Look at the questions we're asking. The questions we're asking are not technical. Are you the information asset owner of the information asset? Are the details of the information asset accurate and current? Do you agree with the indicated risk level? Has the way the business uses the information asset or holds the data changed significantly in the last 12 months? See, you're asking them very generic questions that they should be able to answer. You notice what we're doing as well. We're giving them help. We're giving them no excuse not to answer it. We're given Pacific links. And what we actually do in real life is we provide explainer videos for every single question tailored to the customer. So if you don't know what's the indicator level, you click a link. Up pops a little explainer video and you usually get about 120, 150 seconds to explain what the indicated risk level means. You can also give examples specific to the customer and you would go across and select from, strongly agree, agree, undecided, disagree, or strongly disagree. And again, you're asking these people to do their own risk assessment, but it is not technical. If you get down to some of the questions that may be more question, and we only put in this one 25 questions, short and sweet, it's only 25 questions. And you ask questions like, look, does the information asset make use of any cloud service or feature? You click the link, you get a little two minute explainer video explaining what the cloud is and how it's different and how they would know. And then you get examples. So-and-so system uses the cloud, the other system doesn't use the cloud. And then they have to answer questions. Definitely, it's a cloud hosted system. Probably, it could use cloud storage like OneDrive or AWS. Possibly, it connects to other systems like Office 365 or a government gateway. Probably not. The system can be accessed from the internet, but it's hosted locally. Definitely not. The system is local only. We need senior management to understand technology to this basic, basic level. They are the people that are legally accountable and they are the people that must make those decisions.
What we then do in something like a CSA is there's a lot of calculations to do. You'll notice that risks are all weighted. So th there's a hierarchical risk rating between different questions. And then what we do is we generate reports and we do all the calculations and standardizations on the back end. And what we end up with is this. KPI is a key performance indicator. A KRI is a key risk indicator. And a CSF is a critical success factor. Again, straight out of COVID and ISACA. You'll notice for this particular customer, we decided to break risk into five silos. Administrative risks, change risk, BCP and DR risk, information risk and technology risk. And we split that into two main indicators, a business risk indicator from the business perspective and a technical risk indicator. And then we combine the whole lot together into a critical success factor. And we have weightings and calculations at the back end. And of course, you have to standardize these results. This is not an effective risk system on day one. You have to control, uh, do control tests and standardizations and the calculations and formulas we use allow us to standardize those scores. But you can see what we're trying to do with a controlled self-assessment. We're trying to push the ownership back to the business to say, look, you are responsible for administrative risks. If things change quickly, that will increase risk. BCP and DR is absolutely critical. It will impact both a business risk and a technical risk. But then there's some risks that are more technical, like data protection, which would be an information risk, or a lack of a firewall upgrade, which would be a technical risk but we're trying to get how the business views the world and we're trying to get their engagement straight out of the gate. I eventually, after years of going straight to step five, I eventually included a control self-assessment and all my risk work. And I think it's effective because you get that business engagement at the very start because the first people you ask are the owners, not the technical people. But at some stage, we have to get the lid off and we have to go into the information systems. We have to look at their vulnerabilities. We have to vulnerability scan them. We have to look at pen test results. We have to perform an IS risk assessment. Next. The proper thing that most people expect to have to cover in an IS risk assessment. Step five do the IS risk assessment. And straight away, less than five. Assessment is not analysis. Assessment is not analysis. There is the Institute of Risk. The Institute of Risk is the governing or chartered body for all different sorts of risk professionals. And the Institute of Risk says, it's not me, it comes from their website. It has a really important saying on it. Much of what you see today in the world is risk assessment without any analysis. You see, there's a difference between the two. We must understand the difference between a risk assessment and a risk analysis. You see, risk management is the overall process. That should be standardized from the board down. It should be the same for every risk process we do. Risk assessment is looking at each technical area. Our technical area is information systems risk. And to ascertain what the technical risk will be. But the technical risk is not what we're really after. We want to do an analysis of what that technical risk will do to the business, the business impact analysis. And I see so many risk processes that just do step five. Step five, it, it, what's the purpose of it by itself? Step five doesn't make sense by itself. It only makes sense if it's part of an eight step process. 
Much of what you see today in risk management is assessment without meaningful or accurate analysis. The result is purely informed prioritization and cost ineffective decisions. You see, it's supposed to fit into this. This is this is business this is business continuity. BCP, BCP, BIA, and risk. You see, this is the as the Harvard MBA model. This is part of business continuity planning. And what's supposed to happen is BCP is your senior leaders making ultimate decisions. This is where we decide on what we're going to do. A BIA is supposed to be about functional managers and it's all about how much this may cost the business you see these people who your leadership don't actually these days understand actually how each department works in its minutia they're too high up they have a macro overview so these people delegate out to the bc bia bia business impact analysis but these people don't understand political risk financial risk market risk information systems risk so we need specialists we need specialists and the specialist job is to work out the technical impact and percentage probability or likelihood. You see, this, a lot of companies just do this. You see, the goal of doing this is to take the output of this and feed it into the BIA. The BIA takes the results so far technical risk assessment and looks at the business impact of what will this actually do to the company how much will we lose how much will we lose per hour per per day per week per month look it could be a really major technical flaw but if it's not going to cost the business any money how serious is it and that's what we're trying to ascertain. The difference between having a technical risk and having a business impact. And it's the business impact analysis that is supposed to, then supposed to take the output of this to feed in to the BCP where we make decisions. This is supposed to be part of your business continuity processes where the business looks at all the risks to the organizational strategy. The strategy is the number we're going to make this year. BCP, BIA and risk. You see, no point in doing that if you're not doing this as well. And a lot of IT departments are stuck down here wondering why it's not working. You're missing two thirds of the model if it's only an IT process. Vulnerabilities are not risks. You can have a serious technical vulnerability, but the business impact might be negligible. A vulnerability is not a business risk. It may lead to business risk. The whole purpose of doing our risk process is to find out whether or not this is going to have a significant business impact if it happens. Vulnerabilities are technical weaknesses. Threats, the potential that a vulnerability can be exploited. Sorry about the typo. Risk, the likelihood of a track acting upon a vulnerability. Vulnerabilities are not technical risks. We do a vulnerability assessment to work out how bad the technical issue is, 
how urgently should we look at it? How urgently should we perform a risk assessment on it? Okay. The technical risk assessment takes a look at the vulnerability, the threat, and the risk from a technical perspective we can end up with a really bad technical risk with no business impact. Spectre and Meltdown. Spectre and Meltdown were two flaws in CPUs. They were really technically horrific. But the chance of someone causing significant business loss because of Spectre and Meltdown was teeny. So even though the technically assessed risk was that size, if you moved it into a risk analysis, the risk analysis would say, you know what? They weren't actually that important after all. Is this making sense? The difference between a vulnerability and a risk. You can have the worst vulnerability in the world. If there's no easy to use exploit, then it's not a technical risk. If it's a bad vulnerability and there's an easy to use exploit, it's a big technical risk. But if that will have very little impact on your business, the way you're structured, the way you have controls, the business risk analysis might say the business risk is actually really quite small. Got to get your head around the difference between a serious vulnerability, a major technical risk, and a big business impact. Three separate things. IS risk assessment systems. A good IS risk assessment system should combine all three, the vulnerability, the threat and the risk. It should be easily repeatable. It should have many information sources. It should standardize my result. CVSS is my personal favorite. This conducts the technical side of the risk assessment process. You see, if I need physical access to a server, for 30 minutes to carry out an attack. The vulnerability that allows me to do the attack could be critical. But if I have really good physical security, do I need to worry about it? See, my physical security might mitigate the vulnerability. And even after that, even if I've got weak physical security, if it's not going to have a business cost, then it still might be negligible. You see, there's a huge difference between the three of them. Let's take a look at CVSS. CVSS, I'm going to do a demo, but as we slide before it, CVSS has three parts to it. It has a base metric, a temporal metric, and an environmental metric. You see, this is really your vulnerability. It's the purely technical. The confidentiality impact, the integrity impact, the availability impact, how complicated it is, what permissions that are needed. That's your base metric group. But that changes over time. If it's a zero day, there's no protection or control, so the risk is going to be huge. If over time there's a patch release, the risk will drop. And as the patch gets older and more and more people deploy it, the risk goes down again. There's a temporal metric. So this is your vulnerability. This is your temporal metric. And everybody's network is different. The controls that you have in place need to be taken into account. If you take three organizations, a lighting manufacturer, a bank, and GCHQ. The same technical vulnerability will have a different risk rating in a lighting manufacturer who probably has pretty low level of security. In a bank who have a much higher level of security. And the same vulnerability may have a very low risk level inside GCHQ. 
because you have to take into account the controls and the way you operate and the protection mechanisms you have. I love CVSS because most of them only do this, but CVSS goes into temporal and environmental. This is CVSS version three, and we're not happy with it because it leaves lots of things out. So we're going to go to version four, and we won't be happy with that either. There'll be a version five and a version six. The point is you can't just do this. It doesn't exist by itself. And there is a great calculator in CVSS that allows you to calculate. This is an open source system. OK, there's even free training. I know I'm a training provider, but there's free training available. And it's the one that I use myself. It gives me a base score. And a temporal score and an environmental score. And I love the fact that it's got an environmental score because each network, you might have one network at bronze, one network at silver, one network at gold, one network at platinum. And this same attack is going to have a different technical impact on each of those four levels of security. It's called a modifier. So we take the, the base score, which is really our vulnerability score, and we modify it to each customer. OK, I really do like this. There's lots of good stuff on CVSS. There's a great user example. There's guides, there's calculators. There's a whole load of really useful open source stuff. CVSS, Common Vulnerability Scoring System 3.1. OK, uh, technical vulnerability. Whoops, clicked it again. Technical vulnerability assessment system. Now we've done all this work. We have to go back to the business and say, look, we now understand that this technical thing has this probability of occurring. And we have to ask the business. What does that mean to you? What's it going to do to our strategy? What's it going to do to our bottom line? Is it going to cost us a huge amount of pain? Or is it going to cost us very little pain? We need to do a business risk analysis. What? How did that end up in there? I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. Ah, right, OK. Risk must be understood. You see, if you do it in a different language, what's the point of it? When we get to this stage, we're supposed to have translated this into a common shared language so that when we approach the business, it looks like every other risk the company considers. I, I constantly find, constantly find, 15 or 20 risk reports going to a board and they're all different they use different letters different numbers different colorings different grading systems the goal was to translate it what's the point in translating a risk into gaelic if your board doesn't speak it what's the point in translating it into spanish if your board doesn't speak it? i mean it'll be this equivalent to board reports business cases being written in 10 different languages when the board only speaks English. What a waste of time. How many organizations make that fundamental flaw? You've done all the hard work. How do you use the results? You're supposed to use the results to do a business impact analysis. The business impact analysis are the business people been able to say, and you're making it easy for them. You're making it easy at this stage. OK, I, I always say your senior management team, do you know what they really want? Pretty pictures and nice colors. They want it re Look, I have to make decisions about Political risk, economic risk, health and safety risk, financial risk, IS risk. 
highest risk is only one of the things I have to consider. So we have to make this decision easy for them. Risk analysis is understanding the business impact of technical risks. It's the right information to allow them to, effect, to make effective business decisions. No tech, no babble. The whole reason why we did this was to remove the tech, no babble. There's no mention of ransomware. There's no mention of cross-site scripting or cross-site uh, request forgeries. There's no firewalls. There's no XDR or SOAR. There's no techno babble in it. We have to come up with some method to allow them to be able to compare apples with apples. And what we suggest that we do is we need, we need two things. We need some advice from senior management. They're supposed to tell us. This is how you will report risk. They're supposed the management of risk department is supposed to standardize the risk reporting across all business units to allow businesses to look across all their portfolio, to look at all their risks, no matter what they are and to be able to know where to spend the limited amount of resources we have. We haven't got infinite resources, so where's the best place to spend it? The goal of risk is supposed to make it easy for them to do it. We have a right to expect senior management to understand this. This is supposed to be the language that they speak. If your senior management don't understand the language of risk. Can I ask you a question? Why are you doing risk assessments? Because we started off by saying the whole purpose of a risk assessment was to translate it into a shared language. If they don't understand that language, why are you doing risk assessments? It's a pointless process. The point of the process is to translate it into a language they do understand. So how do I make it easy for them? What can I do to get them to make an effective decision? How many times have I said that? Effective decision. I think this is one of the most important. I think the first point, risk is a translation. And I think lesson eight, give them options, not solutions, is extremely important. Senior managers don't like this, by the way. Senior managers want us to give them solutions. Why? Because if I tell them what to do, I've become accountable. This is why senior manager go, no, 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 no. Sure, sure you know best, Sean. You, you, you're the expert. You tell me what I should do. No. I can tell you all about the technical vulnerability, the technical impact, and the technical likelihood. I can tell you all about the technical controls that we can put in place to fix it. But I can't tell you what it will do to the company. I can't tell you what the business impact of this will be. So we give them choices, not solutions. The business is accountable. They make the decision. When they make the decision, they own the residual risk. We offer the business choices like bronze, silver, gold and platinum. Here's your bronze choice. It will cost you this much. It'll have this change to the business process. This is the impact that the control will have. And this is what it'll do to the color of the risk. It'll take risk from bright red and turn it to light orange. So if you want it to go from bright red to light orange, you want a bronze solution. The silver solution is going to cost you more. 
it might have a bigger impact on business operations. And it's going to take the color from bright red to orange. If you want the gold solution, it's going to cost you even more. It might even have a bigger impact on business operations, but it's going to change the color from red to orangey green. And maybe you think you want the platinum solution because the platinum solution takes the red color and changes it to green. But can you afford it? See, the truth is, I don't care what the business wants to do with the risk. I don't care what the business wants to do with the risk. All I care about is what they can afford to do with the risk. Being able to want something and to be able to afford it are two completely different things. So the cost has to come into the equation. And the only people that can effectively make that decision for significant risks is the business. Of course, there's lots of stuff that we will do ourselves. If it's only going to be a minor risk, if it's very minor, we will do it ourselves. We'll go to our risk committee and we'll report that it's been done. But if it's a major decision that requires a major cost, if it's going to have a large impact on the business, then we need to get them to make the decision. We offer them choices. Every single risk report that we do in a COVID-based environment, we give them four choices. And it's up to the business to do the analysis and to pick the right choice for the business. Can you see what we're trying to do? We're trying to turn this round into a framework that allows them, when there's significant expenditure or significant risk, that allows them to make effective decisions. IS control design and implementation. OK, that was supposed to be step eight, I think. And step eight is about this. It's about the three different functions that COVID suggests. We have the senior management team. We have the information secu uh, system security, information assurance team, and we have the IT team. And we're supposed to sit in the middle. The IT team are the custodians. They implement the right technology. They implement the controls. They manage controls. The leadership team, the business, they make decisions. And we sit in the middle. And we're able to look both directions, speak both languages, and facilitate the two to understand each other. We're supposed to look at the policies for advice. We update our standards and guidelines if necessary. And the IT department, if they install new controls and new technology, implement step-by-step -step procedures, policy, standard, guideline, procedure. The people who are accountable are way over here. The people who are responsible are way over here. So we need a feedback loop. So with the delivery side, this is when you look at your KRIs, your KPIs during audits and pen tests. We take that information, summarize and aggregate it into dashboards and critical success factors. And all the board really wants to know is strategic achievement. Will the amount of risk that we have have a likely impact on us achieving business objectives this year? Because they don't care about firewalls and ransomware. The senior team only cares about strategic achievement. And that's what we're trying to do. Help them create a profitable business to achieve our strategy this year. I think I'll have to step out there, by the way. Step seven, I think the last one should have said. This is a very strange ending step. Step eight, audit. Management need assurance. Audit provides it. The truth is, they would gladly let somebody take this away. They, they don't want this. 
they must make good decisions because they're accountable, but all they really want to know, you told me you'd keep it orange, and they want to know, is the risk in real life that's happening right now, is it orange or is it orangey red or is it red or maybe it's green? If it's green, could we do some cost savings? You see, management just want to know, is the colour of the risk or the risk rating we've told them that they have, is it real or is it different? They need assurance that what they've asked for, they've got. It's audit provides that assurance. IS audit checks the implementation of the business risk decisions. Audit becomes the eyes and ears of senior management. It tries to measure what's actually happening versus what is supposed to be happening. In ISACA, audit and risk work together. In ISACA, as an auditor, I must work with a risk specialist. I audit business processes. Risk specialists calculate risk. So you would have a C risk doing the risk calculation and a CISA doing the audit. In ISACA, both roles go together. And what management really wants to know is something unexpected going to happen that can interrupt their business strategy this year. I know unexpected things will always happen and the future is not perfect. We can't predict it, but we can attempt it. And all the risk models and all the risk frameworks we have, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give the business confidence about the level of risk that they face. Not too much, not too little, we need to get that balance right. And in actual fact, on the last session of today, we're going to talk all about the fact that management do not want minimum risk. They don't want minimum risk. Minimum risk will usually have minimum profit. And the last session today, the one about the senior leadership, we're going to look at inverted yield curves. I know it's exciting, is it? Inverted yield curves. We're going to look about how risk can impact the profitability of an organization. But look, you can go to uni, you can do four years, you can do a master's, then you can do a PhD. And that does not mean you're an IS risk specialist. It just means you're a risk specialist. The calculations and the methods are difficult. Risk itself is difficult. What I've tried to do was to split it into eight steps that I follow. Asset business asset registry to make sure we get clear ownership. An IS risk registry that we perform risk assessments on. We start the risk assessment process with a controlled self-assessment to ensure ownership, to ensure that when we do the translation, there is somebody there to make a decision who is accountable. The IS risk assessment itself is the technical and difficult to do thing. I use CVSS and there are lots of open sources uh, for CVSS risks and lots of tools that support CVSS. The business risk analysis is another thing that's often left out, where the business looks at the technical risk assessment and looks at the impact on the organization. And it's that impact that they make a decision of. You can have a really bad technical risk that has very little business risk, uh, very little business impact. Oh, six, seven, uh, six was business risk decision. We give them choices. We don't tell them what to do. We don't provide them solutions. We give them choices. And the reason why we give them choices is because tighter controls, better controls, costs more money and we need to get a budget to deliver it. So instead of saying this is what we want you to do, we generally always offer a series of levels such as bronze, silver, gold and platinum. We then make the risk decision. We then outsource it to IT. 
IT of the custodians. They're the people who take our control design and they implement. So the IS team would design the generic control, they'd set up metrics around the generic control, but the budget, the control design, the metrics are given to IT to implement and deploy. IT is the custodians. And finally, to prove that you've done what you're supposed to do, to prove that it works on the ground, the audit comes in to measure what's actually happening versus what's supposed to be happening. And it's the audit that provides the assurance at the end of the day. I tried to split this into lessons. The first lesson was risk processes fix nothing. All it does is translate. It's not all about IT systems. It's about the business and the impact it will have on the business. It's about lesson three. You cannot succeed without risk ownership. Because the reason why you do this is to allow the business to make effective business decisions. Involve the business at every step. I use a control self-assessment process to do that so that when we do the risk process, we know who the owner is and they've accepted that. It's to get engaged. Assessment is not analysis. Assessment is looking at the technical risk and the technical impact. Business impact analysis is trying to work out what that might do to the company. If it doesn't do much to the company, it's not a significant risk. Technical risk and business impact analysis. Vulnerabilities are not risk. Just because it's a serious vulnerability does not mean it's a serious risk. Every network is different. Every network has controls. We have to take that into account. CVSS does a base metric, a temporal metric, and an environmental metric. Most risk systems only do vulnerability. They don't take into account the temporal metric, and they don't take into account your network is different than other people's networks. Risk must be understood. The whole reason why we did it is to translate it into a shared language. Are you sure your senior leadership understand that language? Have you a standardized template? They're supposed to tell us this is what we want. This is how you report it. This is called MOR, management of risk across the company, having a standardized template and measurement methodology, not using several different languages. Give them options, not solutions. The business doesn't like this. They want us to tell them what to do because they don't want to be accountable. If we tell them what to do, we have an effect become accountable. We need them to be accountable, so we give them our choices. Give them options, not solutions. Management need assurance and audit provides it. Even if you do all of this, Audit still plays an essential role because audit then goes round, measures what's actually happening generically across the business on the ground and compares that to what we've told business that is happening and what the business wants to happen. Audit gives us that assurance. But I think the most important lesson, it's probably lesson 10, Nine lessons are not enough. This is difficult. It is a difficult and specialist area. And what you do in a small, a medium, a large and an enterprise organisation will be distinctly different. But the lessons still hold true. Even if you are working in a 12 person company and you are the IT manager stroke Information security manager, stroke, IT manager, stroke, IT director, stroke, you fix everything with a plug in it. You still need to learn those lessons. You still need to do risk assessments. You still need to go to the business owner and you still need to talk a language that they can understand. You still need to offer them choices, not solutions. You see, there's so much in risk. It is difficult to achieve. Large organizations have huge teams of specialists. 
and you can do degrees in this today. So one thing, nine lessons is never going to be enough. Personally, the things that I use are Sea Risk, which is from ISACA. That's all about the management of risk. It uses COBIT, and inside COBIT, there's a framework called Risk IT. And the Risk IT framework is a scenario based risk framework that I would use myself. It creates scenarios and looks at the risks of various scenarios that you can come up with ransomware scenario, denial of service scenario, uh, physical security breach scenario. It comes up with scenarios that you look at and rates the risks of each scenario. CVSS is the CVSS calculator. I would use it myself. I find it highly practical and useful. And ISACA's CISA is the IT and IS audit accreditation and framework that teaches us how to go in and to audit the system and to score it to give the business assurance that our risk processes are effective and working. Whoa, that was long and hard, wasn't it? You see, where do you start with risk? It is such a huge and complicated topic. I wanted to try to help, but that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to see, could I share some practical steps and things that I've learned, lessons that I've learned along the road. Some of them you might take, some of them you might not. But hopefully there's something in this that was of some use to you. We promised at the start of these sessions and we advertised them. No sales, no marketing, just learning. And I hope you agree we've at least attempted to do that. If you enjoyed the session, if you think we really tried to do what we said we do, we'd love you to consider maybe leaving a Google review, maybe following us on LinkedIn. We are NEMSTAR. We are a specialist information security and cyber training provider. We were established in 2009. We're based in the UK and we are always here to help. So if there's something you need help or support with, you've got our website and you've got our email address. We are always delighted to hear from you and we're always here to help. We're coming up to the end of the session, so we're going to be looking at any questions that you put in the chat box. So hopefully you put a few in. Uh, Joanne, have you got any questions for us at the end of this one? Um, yeah, so we've got a follow on on from the earlier question about if the framework can be applied to operational technology, um, saying that doesn't work as IS risk is specialised as it uses the CIA triad to assess risks for assets, which operational risk doesn't use. OK, yes, I totally agree. But the output report and the way we measure risk should be identical across the both. So you're absolutely correct. OK, the way we look at an operational risk like a competitor risk, we have to use a different set of tools than to look at a integrity or uh, ransomware risk. But the point I was trying to make was when the report comes out, the way we measure, do we do it color coded? Do we do it in percentages? Do we do A, B, C, D? It, it's not the mechanism, it's the risk report we produce should be the same across every single element. Does, does that make sense? OK, so hopefully that one does come back with a follow up if it doesn't, please. So, you know, totally agree that we use different toolkits in different areas of risk, but it's the report and the output that we need to standardize, not the methodologies we use to actually conduct the risk assessments. It's the reports and outputs we need to standardize. Does that hopefully that clarifies that? But if there's a follow up question. Keep going on that one. Have we any more questions? Yeah, um, Joe would like to know if you're able to share an example of a real life risk report. OK, that's actually, yeah, you see, that's much more difficult to do than it sounds, because when you do a real life risk report, 
then it's usually for a specific customer under an NDA. What we can share is we can share the risk example reports that we use in the likes of a C risk uh, thing. So ISACA's risk IT process and the ISACA website, they do lots of sample risk reports and generic risk templates to say this is what it looks like and this is how to fill it in. So uh, if you remind me later, Joanne, what we'll do is we'll go to the ASACA website and we'll see can we find some of the ASACA risk templates. Uh, ASACA is a wonderful resource for stuff like that and they have uh, the risk templates done out for reports, levels, all sorts of stuff. So maybe one of those we could share at a later date. Yeah, we'll put that out on LinkedIn and Twitter later on, the links to that whenever we find sure. out. Well, indeed. Anything Keep else? Anything else? No more questions yet. Okay. Look, out of all the sessions I'm delivering today, it's the hardest one to deliver in 90 minutes. I hope I try to make it practical. I hope I try to share steps that I've learned myself and lessons that I've learned along the way. And I hope you can take some of it and apply it to your environment to make it a little bit easier because it is difficult. Are we OK for now then? Folks, I really do hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, we'd love to see a Google LinkedIn review or maybe follow us on LinkedIn. But I think for me for now, that's it for this session. Uh, maybe we'll see you back on another session. There's one more of them tonight. It almost continues this one. So it's almost a continuation. Starts in about 30 minutes time. But for me for now, folks, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Goodbye and stay safe. See you later.